Um, so anyway, so good morning. I'm very pleased to welcome you to uh, this uh, special director's colloquium. And we do have a special guest today, Dr. Ellen, Ellen Williams, um, who's uh, uh, currently a uh, leading long-term strategic planning on tech transfer for the DOE, um, a special advisor to Secretary Moniz. Um, and she also, you will have noticed, is the nominee to direct ARPA-E. Um, and we're eagerly awaiting that. I uh, hope that'll come through soon. Um, uh, so, you know, you know ARPA-E is an organization that, uh, of course, is a very exciting one. Um, it really is a high reward, high risk, uh, rapid response agency modeled on uh, DARPA. Um, and, you know, it's a great challenge, actually, as ARPA-E has, is to really deliver transformational high tech. Um, and you know, if you look at the list of pro projects that ARPRI has already funded, there are some really sort of spectacular ones. And it requires a level of creativity and a level of focus and a level of commitment, uh, which is an interesting challenge to, uh, to get into the system. Um, but of course, what, uh, what Ellen brings to this role is a spectacular understanding of all of the aspects of the, uh, of the energy. Um, uh, and she's going to give us a talk about the energy landscape, uh, sort of very broadly written, about what are the big challenges we face and how we might progress on that. Um, uh, she has a lot of experience with... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm clicking on you. <laughs> this is... Uh, no, I, 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 no, I can't give you a talk. That's right, that's right. So it's... Uh, um, so, I say, so, 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 of course, her history is actually... Uh, many and varied in this. She was, before taking this job, the chief scientist for BP. Um, uh, and before that, she founded and directed the Materials Research Science and Engineering Center at the University of Maryland. And she holds professorships in the Department of Physics and the Institute of Physical Sciences and Technology. Um, she has a, a very active and distinguished research career in nanotechnology, thin film metal oxides, nanoprobes, and the dynamics of surfaces. And she has her PhD in chemistry from Caltech. So please welcome me in joining, uh, welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Williams. Thanks, Peter. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you all for turning out this morning. I know that many of you have had a very busy week. So I'm going to talk about evolution of the energy landscape. I thought this first view graph was particularly pertinent for Argonne, where you have such a strong material strength. Uh, this uh, uh, explores the evolution of the land energy landscape over the last couple of hundred years in terms of how broadly we are uh, drawing on the materials space in meeting the, uh, the new technologies and energy opportunities that we have in the future. And I think it speaks for itself in terms of how much greater complexity we're able to draw on because of science and engineering and material science in meeting our energy challenges. So let me just plunge in here. I'd like to start with this uh, slide. It's from the oil industry. I had this slide made when I, this little movie made while I was at BP. First of all, it's, it's a wonderful historical vignette. But as you're watching it, I want you to look at it from the perspective of the, of the evolution of technology. This represents 100 years of transformation and investment in an industry that now is very big and very high tech. So let's see, I guess I can do it like this. OK, so this is an early oil well. <laughs> okay, I, and it's, it was actually not a joke. Why is an oil well called an oil well? Because initially they really were wells. People went down and dug, and they, uh, let's see now, I want to make sure I don't mess this up. They dug. Uh, early health and safety uh, regulations were not what they are today. And this is harvesting the oil, pulling it up in a well. Here's uh, early oil transportation. Clearly safety regulations, uh, environmental regulations weren't what they were. This is evolution of technology. So you saw there, let me back this guy up a little bit. You saw there two huge breakthroughs in technology. So going from wells to percussive drilling, and then going from percussive drilling to top-driven rotary drilling. Huge transformations in the energy space. Early days, technology was not that strong. Wells were pretty shallow. Wells had to be dug all over the place to harvest a, uh, a field. Today, we can dig very deep. You can see complete transformation of how this looks. Uh, 
A modern drilling site looks clean. It's high tech. And I just want to point out to you, see there on the, on the right hand side, that kind of what looks like a gray bank, those are 90 foot segments of oil pipe, uh, of pipe that gets dropped down into the ground. And they are put together, segment by segment, screwed together. Make this go. And if you get down here, we see the storage yard for all that piping. They are screwed together uh, with threads at the end of the piping. And those are inserted one at a time, lowered down the well, driven from the top in a rotary motion. And 90 foot segments at a time, to, and, and you're drilling down to depths of kilometers, multiple kilometers. And so every time the, the drill pipe comes up and down, there's a guy at the top of that rig managing and they're, they're screwing and unscrewing and reassembling those pipes to go up and down under the, under the earth. So it's, it's a huge activity. And let me then just finish the last thing here. So there's one more evolution of technology. And I'll move this guy forward. Okay, so here's our modern oil rig. I told you that we had the top driven rotary motion. The last most recent big evolution in technology was the ability to do horizontal drilling. And that requires going beyond the top driven rotary motion towards a rotary motion driven by the flow of fluids to make the drill bit move. And they can now drill horizontally for, again, for miles with incredible accuracy as to where they're placing that drilling. Very high tech industry. And that's 100 years of R&D investment to get to that point. Okay, so let me talk now about the energy supply and where we are in the world. I love this graph, it's from the EIA. It shows a transition of where we get our energy in the United States and where we have gotten it over the last, again, couple of hundred years. Back in the 1800s, we got all our energy or most of it by burning wood. Uh, then we started burning more and more coal, coal at the early part of last century. Oil kicked in, then gas and we have hydro energy, nuclear energy, and other renewables, and so on. So we've had a huge transformation in how we get our energy from basically biomass towards largely fossil fuels. And in itself, that's an interesting story. It's not the whole story because this just shows the share of the, uh, uh, of the investment. Of course, what's happened at the same time is that while we've made a transformation in the share of the investment from these different sources, we've also vastly increased the total amount of energy that we use. So now that we look at it this way, we can see, oh, for heaven's sakes, biomass is pretty much the same as it was back in the 1800s. We're still using about the same amount. What has happened is we've had a huge increase in our total energy use with a concomitant huge increase in the amount of fossil energy that we're, uh, fossil fuels that we're burning to produce our energy. And that in itself would just be fine. Fossil fuels are uh, an incredible uh, resource. It's like the free lunch that you think you never were going to be able to allow it to get. And in fact, of course, it's not really a free lunch. And the reason it's not a free lunch is that as we burn a fossil fuel, we are releasing into the atmosphere carbon dioxide. The fossil fuels were formed by placing uh, carbonaceous materials under the earth that were taken from CO2 in the atmosphere and processing and pushing and squeezing them under high pressures and high temperatures for hundreds of millions of years. So the CO2 originally came out of the atmosphere and now we're putting it back in. So before the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was about 290 parts per million. Um, by, 19, uh, by the mid-1900s, we were up to 320. And uh, scientists know and we all know that there's an impact of having CO2 in the atmosphere because CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It's a very interesting paper if you look up Arrhenius, one of the great fathers of uh, physical chemistry, looked at the issue of CO2 in the atmosphere back in the late 1800s and understood even back then that having more CO2 in the atmosphere was going to trap heat in the atmosphere and eventually cause warming. And Arrhenius's early estimates were actually very good. <laughs> he got very close. And so a, a lot of the controversy and discussion that's going on today about how much warming, is it really warming, and so on, we understand the mechanism. We understand the effect. The arguments are really over the details of what's going to happen. By increasing CO2 in the atmosphere, we are going to warm the Earth. Scientists believe that uh, we need to keep the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere below 
450 parts per million to avoid an average two degrees Celsius increase in the world's uh, overall temperature. We passed uh, 400 parts per million a couple of years ago for the first time, and we're increasingly above 400 parts per million now. So I'll show you later on, staying below 450 is a very difficult challenge. Okay, so I just want to comment on energy scales. So in the energy industry, we don't, don't all use God's units, the joule. Okay, so <laughs> the, world, the world uses about 500 exajoules of energy per year, and I can't tell you how nice it is to talk to an audience where I can just say exajoules and not worry about it. Okay, um, very seldom do uh, people who actually work in the industry energy industry use the unit joules. Um, in the EIA, we often talk about British thermal units, and a quadrillion British thermal unit is 10 to the 15th Brit British thermal units. So the world uses about 480 quads of energy per year. Um, in the oil industry, we often talk about energy in terms of tons of oil energy equivalent, so GT, uh, TOEs or barrels of oil energy equivalent. That's the amount of energy you would obtain if you burnt say a ton of oil with 100% efficiency. Okay, so those are different units of energy. Uh, I think in my talk I've got TOEs, I've got BOEs, and I've got BTUs, and I've got exajoules, and I apologize, but I just got too tired to change those all over. Another point that's of interest is to remember that not all fossil fuels are created equal in terms of the amount of CO2 that's released per unit energy on their combustion. So basically, the higher, higher your hydrogen content, the more energy you get out per, uh, CO2, for, per CO2 released. So methane uh, has a um, much lower uh, CO2 emission per megajoules of energy released than coal, up at 0.19. But then if you go down to things that have oxygen in them, you lose again on your energy efficiency. Okay. So I'm going to just start with a little bit of an advertisement for some work that I did at BP. Uh, there I ran something called the Energy Sustainability Challenge, and we were very interested in the overall uh, space of energy and how it interacts with the environment. Some questions about, well, we know about energy's impact on the atmosphere through CO2. How much should we also worry about energy and its impact on water and on land and on minerals? And so I'll just quote, show you a quick synopsis of the uh, results. If you'd like more information, these three booklets that we put together are pretty information heavy, and you can download them at that website. But here's an, a synopsis of, uh, of basically what we found. So we've got energy there in the center. Some folks have said to me, why did you put energy in the center? I said, because I'm a physicist. I always put energy in the center. So we put energy in the center, and we looked at the connections to the different resources. So the connection between energy and land use right now is a very weak one. It only would become strong if we were in a world where we were looking at a lot of biofuels, biomass for energy production. The connection between energy and minerals uh, is somewhat strong because a lot of energy goes into processing minerals to make them into the materials that we use. Um, and the connection between energy and water uh, looks about 10% you know, of the world's water withdrawals are used in energy production. The vast majority of that is in cooling for power generation. Very little of it on an absolute scale is in terms of the extractive industries themselves. The biggie for water is irrigation. And then the real take home message from this is that yes, there are impacts of energy and we have to worry and manage how energy impacts minerals, uh, water and land. And often those are very significant regional issues, but the big impact still is the connection of energy to the atmosphere. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do in the talk today. I'm going to talk about energy projections, what we think is happening now and what we think is, might happen in the future, how those projections are done. And then I'll give a little bit of a discussion about broader perspectives on technology and talk about how this all fits in with science. Okay, so energy use. Most of you have probably seen a Sankey diagram. Uh, they're really useful ways of understanding our energy space and understanding the impact of the decisions that we might make. So in the Sankey diagram, uh, the vertical axis is basically those, the width of the bars correspond to how much energy. And we start over at the left with the, the energy sources. So you see on the upper, oops, sorry, wrong one. Okay, see up here how much oil. So this one's in exajoules. 
I believe, 475 exajoules. 152 of those come from burning oil, 54 from biomass, 97 from gas, and so on. Then we go to the right and we say, well, what did we burn that for? In burning that oil, how did we do it and where did it go? Direct fuel use, uh, just burning the fuel and using it in, uh, in engines and oil burners. Biomass, again, in burners to generate steam. Gas in burners to generate steam, coal, and so on. How we're burning them and what we're creating. And then, what are we doing with that energy? So we can see how we go from oil to transportation, which is our primary application. 106 uh, exajoules of all that energy ends up in transportation. And finally, what we get for it is our passenger kilometers and our freight ton kilometers. So we can make a direct, direct line of understanding between how we use the energy, where it comes from, and what it's used for. And think about the consequences of where we make our decisions and how they propagate back into our thoughts about where we're getting our energy in the first place. Okay. In addition to energy use, we're concerned about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we can look at the same kind of Sankey diagram in terms of greenhouse gases. So now I have the end uses over on the left. So let's look at, again, our mobility, us moving ourselves around and us moving freight around. We move to the right. We see where the energy is coming from, and we trace that back over. Most of it's coming from oil. And here's the greenhouse gas emissions related to oil. So burning oil for transportation is a good 20% mm, of the total human greenhouse gas emissions every year. Interesting thing in this chart, the greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 is not the only greenhouse gas. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. Some nitrogen, nitrous oxide compounds are powerful greenhouse gases. Fluorocarbons are powerful greenhouse gases. So about 60% of the greenhouse gases that humanity releases every year are due to burning fossil fuels for energy. The other 40% are primarily from agriculture, much more difficult to deal with because these are not point sources and because agriculture is a low margin business. But again, we can look at this and start to understand the choices that we might need to make if we're really serious about releasing these uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so where are we now in terms of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions and where are we likely to be in the future? Future. I'm going to show you some slides from BP's Energy Outlook. BP does economic projections, uh, very similar to a lot of other agencies, EIA, IEA, and so on. And so these are, these are nice ones, and they're very consistent with ones that you'll see from other organizations. So I've got three charts here. On the left, it's consumption by region, so we're, and we're projecting from through the past, we know the past, we're not projecting, to today, and then projecting into the future. And so you can see that uh, by region, energy use today about 12 billion tons of oil equivalent is projected to go up by about 25 or 30 percent in the next 20, 20 years or so. The vast majority of the, of the growth is going to be in the developing world. The developed world, that's OECD, which is basically the Western nations, are going to be relatively flat in their future energy use. How, are we, how is that going to be used? Um, a fair amount of it is used in industry, and of that, a fair amount is electricity. Other electricity uses are in the commercial sector and the residential sector, and then we've got some in transport. But here, transport is not the vast majority of our energy use overall. And then the final column, which is where is that energy going to come from? It's going to come from increasing amounts of oil, increasing amounts of gas, increasing amounts of coal, and increasing amounts of low carbon energy sources. Everything's going to be increasing. We're going to see great in this projection. We're going to see big increases in the use of uh, renewable and low carbon energy sources. But there's still not going to be more than about 20% based on the projections of this, uh, of, this, of this study. And I have to say that in all of these studies, these projections are based on economic assessments. BP and many others do a, an assessment based on what appears most likely to happen depending on how people are behaving today. So this is not what has to happen. It's not what should happen. It's just what looks like it's most likely to happen. And EIA's projections don't look much different than this. OK, so what does that mean? OK, so what that means in the context of climate change, and this is from the IEA a few years ago. And it shows the world emissions of CO2 in gigatons. 
um, versus time. And the upper gray curve is IEA's business as usual case. It's actually a little bit more severe than uh, BP's projection case. If we go on the way we are going now, based on that kind of projection I showed you that BP showed and that other people have as well, by the end of this century, we'll be at greater than 800 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. That is not good news. It's really bad. Okay. If, if all the countries in the world just abided by the commitments that have been made in various climate change uh, fora and meetings, uh, oops, sorry, we would have this situation where this is what IEA calls their new policy scenario, and energy use would start to level off in the next 20 years. That's good. You know, you think this is wonderful, energy use is leveling off. Good, we're stopping re releasing CO2. Isn't this great? The unfortunate thing is that stopping isn't enough because once CO2 is released into the atmosphere, it stays. It stays for a very long time, in part because there aren't many mechanisms to drop it out of the atmosphere, and in part because a lot of it has gotten dissolved into the oceans and there's a buffer situation. So as we reduce our emissions, more CO2 will then just come back out of the oceans. So we have a long time scale, hundreds of years, for the CO2 that's in the atmosphere now to come down. It's not just going to happen. So just leveling off our CO2 emissions would be better, okay? But we'd still be well above 450 parts per million by the end of the century. To actually get to the point where we can get to 450, we actually have to dramatically decrease our CO2 emissions. IEA put together a variety of different options for doing that, which is like more nuclear, um, moving from coal to gas or other forms of energy, more uh, renewables, more end use switching, uh, more carbon capture and storage, which is one that they highlighted, and then uh, a lot more energy efficiency. Okay. So that looks very daunting. Can we really reduce our CO2 emissions that much? It's not easy. But what's surprising and people don't recognize is that even this very rigorous path doesn't require us to go t cold turkey and make a complete transformation in our energy landscape instantly. So if we stuck on the BAU path, we've seen this before, moving forward in the future, we'd have a lot more energy use and most of it would still be fossil fuels. The new policies, the flat one here, a little bit less energy use, but that's not huge a little bit less fossil fuels, and even the 450 scenario. It's a significant decrease in energy use, a significant decrease in fossil fuels, but even by 2035, this is not saying that the oil and gas industry has to go away. We can still continue to have the economic benefits of uh, fossil fuels and at the same time rapidly decrease our CO2 emissions if we have the will. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to some of the basis for the, uh, the energy projections. So some of the things that get paid attention to in making these energy projections are basically, what's the cost? There's a lot of things that we can do technically, but the question always then becomes, are we willing to pay the cost for those? And I think this is a really potent chart. It's the cost of electricity. This is a levelized cost of electricity. It puts in place, how much does it cost to build the initial power plant? You have to pay back your return on investment at, say, 7%. You have to pay the operating costs to run the plant and the transmission costs. And the bars there are uh, <coughs> calculations that BP had done uh, back around 2012 or 2013. And the little stars are ones that I put on there. These are recent uh, estimates from EIA that they've put in place for what they think might happen now. And you don't need to look at these specific numbers because these are projections and estimates that vary regionally, but the trends are very, very clear. So over here on the left, we've got gas as a source of electricity generation. And right now you can produce electricity from gas at 60 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. And that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Six cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, if you put on that a carbon tax, People are talking about putting in place a carbon tax to greatly change the balance of economics. The price of producing electricity with gas would go up maybe seven to seven cents, not a huge increase. If you put on carbon capture and storage, EIA says even that's not going to cre create that much of a uh, increase in price, although BP at least a few years ago thought a lot worse. Okay. Today, gas is economically competitive much better than coal for a new build plant. 
But in the United States, we have a lot of existing coal plants. People don't want to tear down an existing plant that's making money and build a new one. But on a dollar for dollar basis with a new plant, coal is a little bit more expensive than gas. The impact of the carbon price is much more severe on coal because coal has a car higher amount of carbon released per unit energy. And similarly, the price of putting CCS right now on a coal plant is much higher than putting it on a gas plant. And we have nuclear about uh, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Geothermal, which in the best cases is down at 40 or 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Bioenergy, just burning wood or other biomass to produce electricity. Uh, again, about 10 cents a kilowatt hour at the best case. Then we have the intermittents, which aren't baseload. We have the issue that those go on and off with time. So there's some drawbacks to using them, but onshore wind is economically competitive right now in terms of ener electricity generation. Offshore wind still very expensive and being developed. Solar has come down dramatically over the last five to 10 years, and it's getting to the region where at least in terms of peak energy demand, solar is starting to look competitive. Solar thermal is still expensive, and here we compare a, single a simple gas turbine. And the reason for making this comparison is that when you have demand, uh, instantaneous demand at high peak places that there isn't a sufficient uh, capacity in the standard base load fleet. You go to simple gas turbines that can be turned on quickly. So now you start to see that in super peak, some of these renewables can be competitive, start to be competitive with, uh, with fossil fuels. Okay, so these types of considerations go into the decisions about what's likely to happen in the future uh, that you saw in some of the projections. Another thing um, we often worry about and hear people talking about is, well, do we really have to worry about making this transformation or driving this transformation because aren't we just going to run out of oil and gas anyway? Okay, so, and those kinds of discussions are often confused because people talk about reserves. What's our reserves of a given resource? And then they say, well, if you've got a reserve of this amount in the world and we're producing it at that amount, we can figure out how long till we run out. The problem is that reserves is not a technical scientific term, it's an economic term. So when people talk about reserves and resources, we can look out at the world and as scientists we can estimate how much uranium is there out there all over the Earth's crust. And then most of that's not accessible. There's some of it that we think that we could get, some that we think we can't. What ex might be accessible is the resources. And then the reserves are what we can develop economically. What's it, what can you develop and have it be worth the investment that someone puts into it? And then there's the identified reserves. How much do we actually know about? Has been measured? Do we think it's there? Do we guess it's there? And so both this boundary and this boundary change with time. And I'm going to show you a very neat example of that. It's copper. Okay, so here's copper. Today our reserves look like about 630 million tons of copper all over the world. We're using copper at a rate of about 16 million tons per year. So if I divide this by that, oh my gosh, we're going to run out of copper in 39 years. That's a little daunting because the world's going to be a sad place without copper. But look at this example over here. In 1970, the global reserves of copper were 280 million. They were smaller than the reserves are today, and in that time we've used about 400 million tons of copper. So what's happened in those years is that both the proven reserves and the economics of producing copper have changed. And what I'm going to show you is that for oil and gas, whatever reserves we talk about or people have talked about, there's a lot. We're not, we're not going to end the fossil fuel age because we run out of fossil fuels. Okay. So here's an example, long-term cost of supply curve for crude oil. So what we've got here on the vertical axis, and this is from IEA again, is production cost and uh, versus the amount of resource. So going back in time, the world has already produced about a thousand, sorry, BB is billion barrels. This is billion barrels of oil equivalent energy. So the world's already used about 1,200 billion barrels of oil equivalent energy. and that was produced at very low cost, 10, 20, 15 dollars per barrel. Anybody remember what the, know what the price of oil is uh, right now? 
Yeah, it's about 75. It's come down. It was above 100 a few years ago. Now it's about $75 per barrel. So huge price difference, huge profit there. If you can produce an oil at this price and sell it at 75, you're making a lot of money. Looking forward in the future in the Middle East, there's at least that much again to be produced. As much as we've had before is still out there at very low production costs. Oil production in the rest of the world varies dramatically in, uh, in price, but still uh, almost all of it is economically producible at this moment. Uh, there's ways enhanced oil recovery to increase the amount of oil you get out of a reservoir. Then there's extra heavy oil and bitumen. Extra heavy oil is produced, for instance, in Venezuela. It's a low grade, not very uh, attractive oil with higher CO2 emissions. And bitumen is basically oil sands as we have in Canada. And so those are more expensive to produce. When, when the price of oil was $110 a barrel, they were very attractive. Now a little bit borderline. And then over here, other sources of fuels, we can do synthetic fuels, gas to liquids, take natural gas and turn it into liquid fuel, coal to liquids, and here are the, uh, the fossil fuels. And so you can look at all of these cost curves and make the comparisons. But the main point here is that we're not going to run out of oil uh, soon. We've got at least 50 years and probably a good 100 years of oil that we can expect to be available if we want to use it. And same thing with natural gas. We've used a lot. This is 100 trillion cubic meters of uh, gas has been used. There's that much and much more in conventional gas. And now we have the shale gas revolution in the United States. Huge reserves of shale gas initially in the United States and eventually worldwide. So again, we're not running out of natural gas anytime soon. Okay, so just again to reiterate, if you looked at this curve that I showed you earlier and said, well, yes, we're projecting increasing amounts of oil, gas, and coal in the future. What if we ran out? We're certainly not going to run out on this time scale. That's built into these projections. And just for, for interest's sake, the new types of oil, of energy that are likely to be in this mix. So the new types of energy that we have are renewables, shale gas, and what's called tight oil and oil sands. And so you can see that in the additional uh, energy sources, most of it will come from conventional sources, but some of it will come from new sources, including tight oil, shale gas, and here's the increase due to renewables and power. Okay, and just again, a little bit of interest from a U.S. perspective, shale gas. Uh, as we look forward into the future, here's shale gas becoming an increasing uh, component of the gas supply worldwide. Uh, it's increasing, but nowhere near as fast as the overall demand for gas is increasing. But of this uh, increase in gas, you see that initially it's all in the United States. And only as time goes on and development takes place in the other parts of the world will that shale gas resource start to be uh, developed worldwide. It's, it's non-trivial to, uh, to make that leap to producing shale gas in new regions. Okay, now let's talk about the United States. So this is EIA projections. So I showed you before that we thought that in the developed world, energy use is going to be relatively flat. Uh, over, the next, uh, over the next century. And we see that also in the EIA projections for the United States. So we see a little bit of an increase, but not a huge increase over the next uh, 25 years. And the breakdown, uh, a lot of oil, coal, uh, liquid biofuels are here in yellow, and renewables are here in green, and there's natural gas. Can't think what that brown one is. Okay. Oh, that's nuclear. So nuclear, they're projecting, is relatively flat. OK, so here's what they're projecting for the future mix in the United States. And you can see here's the, uh, the kind of renewable component. So what does that mean for the US uh, CO2 pr pr uh, emissions? So that's the black curve here. This is the ref, what they call their reference case. And so what they're showing is that for the US, well, it's not awful. Our CO2 emissions are going to be relatively flat. But I showed you before, relatively flat isn't good enough. We really want going down dramatically. Uh, they, I'll show you a little bit more. So the, these are just projections. They're based on a certain set of assumptions. So the EIA tests lots of different assumptions that might come into play and sees how they would play out and what would happen in the future. So high oil and gas resources is where we have a lot of shale oil and shale gas. It increases the emissions a little bit, but not hugely. Here, the blue one 
is a carbon tax of $10 per ton, increasing by 5% per year. That starts to pull us down. Um, S10. This is a, a variant of that. And then this one here, greenhouse gas 25, is a carbon tax of $25 a ton and increasing by 5% per year. And you can all do 1.05 to the uh, 25, and you know that by the end of this period, that's going to be a very substantial carbon tax. But it really drives things down. Okay. So this is, a, this is a couple of examples. Us as we as technologists, this is not looking very, very uh, uh, optimistic, but there is room for optimism. So here's some of the cases that the EIA had looked at in terms of CO2 uh, reductions. So they looked at the case where you didn't phase out some of the tax credits. They looked at a case where the uh, price of renewable power was lower. Uh, here's one integrated high demand technology. This is one where there was more rapid uptake of energy efficiency measures. We know right now that there's a tremendous amount of energy efficiency possibility that's economically viable, but people don't do it because while it's economically viable, they can get a greater return on their investment by doing something else with that money. And so this just estimates higher returns on investment. Uh, accelerated coal retirements, possibly as a result of increasing EPA mercury requirements. And then over here, the, 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 the carbon taxes, which are the ones that have a big impact. So the Secretary of Energy looked at this uh, last summer and he asked them, what if we were doing a lot better with technology? What if we had much stronger advances in technology? So they did some cases where they put in much tighter, much higher demands on what we were developing technologically. Uh, lower, much lower costs for renewable generation, uh, great reduction for more efficient fossil fuel use, much better uh, uptake of biofuels, including drop-in biofuels as opposed to ethanol as a biofuel, uh, more development in electric vehicles, and a lot more industrial efficiency. And so they ran this case and took a look at it. Okay, and here's what we get. So that case basically is these two technology cases plus a lot more technology. And so now we're up to a 7.8% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. That was kind of disappointing. I was really surprised that that much technology innovation wasn't driving a greater decrease in uh, emissions. But then they did one more thing, is they took that and they added that case of advanced technology to a $10 per ton CO2 fee. And amazingly, that drove the greenhouse gas reductions to the same level that you would have gotten with a $25 per ton greenhouse gas fee. So the combination of more technology and a smaller greenhouse gas impact was very, very strong. And this is a nonlinear effect. Okay? So it's much more than the sum of the parts. So if you just took the advanced technology and the $10 fee and add them together, it's nowhere near as big as the uh, combination of the two. So a little bit of a commercial incentive plus the availability of the technologies that make it work can have a huge impact in what the energy future looks like. So that's the good news. It means we have to work really hard. Okay, so, okay. so now let me just change just a little bit. So I've been talking about these projections. These projections are done by economists. And what goes into these projections are as much as they can understand and see as being reasonable now, existing now technologies, they do not get down into the details of how we really might make some of these efficiency changes and uh, uh, greenhouse gas reductions work. So I just want to give you an example of how different ways of thinking about the impacts of technology might greatly change your assessment of the value and the worth of pursuing a technology. And I'm just going to show you an example of a workshop results that we did at BP a few years ago because we were looking at solar fuels and their technical potential. And we looked at a bunch of different types of solar fuels, um, biophotochemical, photochemical, photoelectrochemical, and thermochemical and assessed where they, what their technical readiness was and what their, uh, what their attractiveness was. Now one metric with um, solar fuels, because you have to collect solar energy to make your fuels, one metric is how much land do you have to use to make your solar fuels. Okay, and the baseline there is agriculture. So agriculture is remarkably efficient in that it can do it, but remarkably inefficient in that 
it uses a huge amount of land per the amount of energy capture. So in biofuels, in, in agriculture in general, about 0.2% of the energy that falls on a field is actually captured and used in actually producing biomass. So 0.2% is the number you have to beat if you're interested in land uh, efficiency for producing biofuels. We looked at photoelectrical chemical. All of these are very, very young technologies in very early stages of development. And they're looking today at two, one, two percent efficiencies in terms of uh, capture. So they would be much more efficient in terms of land use. And uh, they have much great aspirational efficiencies for getting much better. But we also realized that of all these solar fuels, there's a comparison that we have to make, which is why go to the point of uh, uh, making a solar fuel when in fact you could just use solar energy, solar photovoltaic energy, and run an electrolyzer. So this comparison, what do you have to compare with in terms of an electrolyzer, becomes the economic uh, case to beat. And so we looked at the economic cases for solar fuels versus, uh, versus electrolyzer. Or actually, we first looked at electrolyzers. We first looked at electrolyzers run by solar energy versus electrolyzers run by nuclear energy. OK, and so this is what uh, that initial assessment looked like. And here I'm going to warn you that this is one way of looking at the problem. And if you just look at this way, you would reach a conclusion, oh my gosh, we, we've got nothing to do here. So if we run on nuclear energy, we can have a very big plant driving it. We can build a big electrolysis plant. We've got economies of scale. We're saying here we're going to buy the electricity from the nuclear plant at something like 10 cents a kilowatt hour. We are going to have to have a return on investment, some depreciation. The cost of compressing the hydrogen that we've produced is a real cost. And uh, so here's our net costs depending on the cost of the electricity okay, and the electrolyzer. Now, if we go to driving this by a solar plant, we imagined what's the biggest single solar plant you could put in one area, maybe about a 17 megawatt solar plant. It's only online 25% of the time. So we have two problems. We've lost the benefit of scale, and we've only got 25% usage. So when we make our, so we've got higher cost of our electricity because PV is more expensive, and we have higher costs up here in our capital and operating costs because we don't have benefits of scale, and we're building something that's only going to be used a quarter of the time. So it winds up looking really bad. And especially if we compare it with methane reforming, which is you just take natural gas, react it with water, and you generate hydrogen. So over here, we're getting close to methane reforming, but up here, it's not looking good. But we looked at this and said, well, you know, this really isn't the right comparison at all. Because this is comparing one-on-one -on -one a solar PV plant to a nuclear plant. Solar PV doesn't look like nuclear. And the whole issue of how we make uh, renewables work in a real system has to do with how we integrate it in the grid. Our electrical grid has a huge amount of overcapacity built into it exactly for the fact that we have variable demand and we have variable online times of all the different uh, sources. So we said, let's take a look at what would happen if we really think about this scenario in terms of the ways we could integrate it in the grid. And so here's what we did is we said, let's imagine a scenario where we're going to start fresh. We're going to build our fossil plant, say a natural gas uh, fossil plant. And we're going to right size it. We're not going to build it with overcapacity. We're going to build another PV plant. It'll be distributed all over the grid, but we can get all this PV. We're going to have these guys run flat out. And whenever there's excess energy, whether it's from the, the gas plant or the PV, we're going to run it through the electrolyzer and produce hydrogen. And we're going to store the hydrogen in tanks. And then whenever we need uh, more electricity, we're going to run it through a turbine and add it to our load. Okay, so that's a different way about thinking about the problem. Okay, and the end results were much better than I hoped they might be. So we did an assessment um, of a natural gas only system, which is, has to be built overbuilt to meet variable capacity. We've got plant expenses and uh, natural gas expenses. We had put a carbon tax in here, but it actually turned out to be relatively the same. And what we found is that in optimizing the system, we could optimize the system to build a smaller natural gas plant, put in the PV farm, and put in the electrolyzer. The cost is a little bit higher overall, but it's not that much higher overall. So you need to think creatively in a system way to understand that the impacts of your technology may be put together in terms of an economic system in much more creative ways than just doing a one-on-one -on -one comparison. And I've seen a lot of people kind of hammer on various uh, renewable technologies with that first type of analysis, say, look, it can't work. 
take another step. There's with some creativity, a lot of things can work. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm going to show this again. I want to remind you, and here I won't stop it a billion times, I'll just let it run. I want to remind you that this is 100 years of investment in R&D in the fossil fuel industry. Okay, so they went from a situation of where they didn't have to worry about health and safety regulations, where they didn't have to worry about environmental regulations, where they had lots and lots of push for developing new technologies, environmental regulations, new technologies. Huge demand, huge competition, and at the end, after 100 years, an extremely high-tech industry, very big, uh, and a big established infrastructure. So we have to change that. We're looking at trying to change that over the course of this, of this century, and it's a very, very big job. It's not something that's just going to happen because we wish it happens. So when they, when they, uh, when they shut down the, uh, the disrupted oil well, BP, at the Macondo accident, at the end, they closed the oil well by running a horizontal drill down into the pipe well below the surface. They were down a mile underwater, two or three miles horizontally. They had to hit a 18-inch diameter pipe, penetrate it, and put uh, concrete into it. Okay, can you imagine that? They drove that horizontal wheel down two miles under the ground, and they hit an 18-inch pipe. That's high technology. Okay, so where are we? We absolutely have to reduce CO2 em emissions, and there's many things that we have to do to make that happen. And we as, as scientists have a huge opportunity to drive improvements in existing technology with new discoveries and new, new approaches based on systems integration. We can't afford to be naive about what we're doing or the context in which we're doing it. There's lots of good ideas, but you have to really keep in mind that we have to emphasize the ideas that really have an opportunity to move forward. We really can expect to be challenged, and we have to be clear about why we're doing what we're doing and how it can be important. And I like this little picture on the lower right. Uh, when I joined industry, coming out of academia, uh, they showed me this, this, uh, the green part of this chart, where it says you start with research, you go to development, you go to demonstration, you go to deployment. I said, no, that's not right. Nothing in technology is that linear. And so, of course, there are arrows running back and forth between all those different sections. But more important than that, there's fundamental research informing every step of that uh, activity. So we have to keep our portfolio balanced with a focus on fundamental research and a focus on development and deployment and a focus on where it's going to come out in terms of impacting the U.S. economy. Okay. So thank you very much for your time and attention. that really informative, inspiring talk. Um, I suspect there may be the odd question in the audience. Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> How many scientists? <laughs> um, so the plan is is very interesting. It's, it's from the U.S. perspective, but you showed right at the start, China and India growth is just dramatic. Do yeah. we have a plan for actually getting them to adopt some of these some of these technologies? Do you, how how do we plan to actually roll them into countries that are more interested in really what the bottom line is going to be? Okay, so the the question is, the real impact of CO two emissions is going to come in the developing world. Okay, and. It's actually pretty hard to put in place these new techniques in the U.S. because we have such an established infrastructure. Much easier to get those new things into the developing world because they're building new stuff. So I think the answer for the U.S. is this is a big impact on U.S. competitiveness and economic growth. If we want to have a big impact and grow our technologies and our manufacturing base, we have to be prepared to sell overseas. So what we develop here can have a huge impact if we get our technologies to the state where they're competitive and sales ready to go overseas. Hi, I'm interested in your position on the renewable fuel standard and if you were queen for the day, how you would change it. Ah. Well, I like the renewable fuel standard. 
Um, I think if I were queen for a day, I would not, I've, I've seen the renewable fuel standards kind of pummeled, pummeled, you know, in the sense that it moved forward more quickly on lignocellulosic than um, we were able to provide lignocellulosic to meet it. And the pushback then is actually risking <coughs> driving lignocellulosic out of the, uh, the fuel. So if I were queen for a day, I'd, I'd step back and I'd put in, I'd put back lignocellulosic with a reasonable phase in period because I think LC is really important to biofuels. With the milk capacity regulation yeah. where it would be forced into the industry? I would, I would put in a requirement for LC as part of the, uh, of the fuel mix. Are there any efforts underway to actually uh, field test the NGCC PV H2 um, technology based on your feasibility yeah. studies? There, there, that, that, ty that type of approach is being investigated in Germany. They're looking at it um, in the, and they're doing something actually pretty creative. They apparently have different pipeline regulations than other people do. They're, in Germany, they're looking at the option of taking their hydrogen and instead of storing it, just mixing it in with their methane. Uh, they're allowed to put about 11% hydrogen. In the US, I don't think we're allowed to put anywhere near that much hydrogen in our pipelines. So there actually is a, a pilot of, of something similar to this going on in Germany, very heavily supported by the company, one of the companies that drives, that does electrolyzer production. So uh, we should pay attention to what's coming out of that study and see how it shapes up. So in your upcoming position, what would be your accomplishment for the first 100 days? Uh, my first 100 days in RPE? So I think my first 100 days in RPE are, okay, my, are first of all, to, to step in as a really powerful spokesman for the importance of what RPE is doing. And so that's, that's what I really need to do, is to get out there and talk to Congress, talk to the Senate, talk to the public about how important what uh, that type of innovation is. Uh, as a scientist, I always also would like to get in there and really start pushing uh, even broader por uh, portfolio of types of technologies that RPE can be looking at. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Natural gas, fascinating with what's happening with Russia and, and uh, Europe. Yeah. Um, it's going to have a huge impact on what our plans are for our natural gas. Do we have plans to look at technologies to get natural gas to places that Russia is threatening? And what do we think that whole, you know, at $75 a barrel, Russia is going to start hollering on, uh, you know, their whole economy is going to holler on that as well. Are those things that come into play for our energy strategy? I guess it's a bigger question yeah. than really RPE okay. is going to focus well, on. Yeah, so, so I, I will say that the answer to your question is yes, it's part of our energy strategy, and I know the secretary is working really hard on that, and I can't answer the detail, any of the details, but DOE, much as we love R&D, DOE has a lot of other roles in addition to, to R&D, and dealing with that type of energy strategy issues is a big part of DOE's role. So I feel like we got about half the story here. Uh -huh. um, looking at, um, I, perhaps it was a 30% reduction in the projected CO2 constant or uh, uh, inputs into the atmosphere. Um, were any uh, follow-on studies done what the economic impact of the energy, total energy use reduction and the additional cost of the energy would be? Um, does it, were the Projections here made on economic neutrality, where growth continued at 3% per year, or is economic growth going to go down? I have to go back and look at the assumptions. I believe that was, that was based on a, a, a standard GDP growth consistent with what we've got now. And so the, uh, the, that's a me those, those estimates, the ones that EAA does are macroeconomic analyses where they put in the drivers and see how the economic system responds. Uh, it's very clear that if you put in a $10 per ton CO2 tax and increase it by 5% a year, there's going to be a net cost. And I don't think, I don't think that they uh, evaluated, because that money goes someplace. You, know, you would make a decision about where that money would go. I doubt they put that into the, uh, the assessment. Yeah. So 
Um, many people have said basically that investing in the United States to change the CO2 emissions from the United States is really yeah. a fool's investment. That if we're going to have a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars, let's say, we ought to take it to Asia and invest it there to try to reduce the amount of CO2 that's produced by those developing countries. Your comment. Okay. Maybe. Um, I mean, that's, 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 that's a perspective. You know, one of, the, one of the issues that arose in the very early climate change discussions was the developing world looking at the developed world and saying, well, this is great. You guys got to develop your economies, burning as much fossil fuel as you wanted, and now you're asking us to bear the brunt. And so in terms of actually getting that cooperation and that international agreements about CO2 emissions, I believe the developed world does have to put its money where its mouth is and drive our emissions down. And as I said earlier, I think the impacts that we can have on the developing world are as we develop and deploy those technologies and demonstrate them, we can expect and drive uh, uptake in the developing world. And I, I, don't, I don't think we can just ignore it for ourselves. One last yeah. question over yeah. So sort of related to that, in the developing world, yeah. um, if they try and mimic our infrastructure, yeah. there's a lot of infrastructure cost versus if they go to distributed energy production. Yeah. Um, have you looked or is somebody looking at the comparison of distributed to um, mimicking our broadly based infrastructure? Yeah, so absolutely. So the question basically is, I think the question is, is the developing world going to follow the same path that we did? And are, is there an alternative path that they can take? Is that roughly? Yeah, yeah. especially with renewables are more attuned to a distributed yeah. infrastructure. Yeah, and so that comes to a, a, a concept that calls the leapfrog effect, which is already very clear. So if you look at the history of CO2 emissions per GDP growth, uh, the United Kingdom was the first country really to industrialize. They went through a huge peak of CO2 emissions. U.S. followed. Our peak of uh, CO2 emissions was lower, shallower, and later. China is now kind of reaching their peak of CO2 emissions. It's lower, shallower, and later. And so there's, you know, there's this leapfrog effect where they're not having to replicate all the things that we did in the past. An example that we really see in a different regime is in... Uh, uh, telephone communications. The developed world, we all built telephone poles and put wires in and did our telephones by, uh, by hardwired communications for tens of years. The developing world just is jumping over that altogether. They're just going straight to cell phones, distributed, uh, distributed communication technology. So there's a lot of work going into understanding whether we can incentivize and make economic more distributed power generation and energy deployment as opposed to the very big centralized grid model that we have in the United States. Huge, huge research topic. So, uh, I th so that was really, I think we should probably stop here because we could carry on with this for a while. It's a very interesting discussion. Um, uh, you know, this very much is DOE's agenda, it's yes, our agenda. Yeah. Uh, and I th like the end point actually is that it's a global agenda and we should actually be thinking about things that may, be, uh, that, that may appear in the developing world before they ever appear here or may just replace what we ever have to do. And I think that's yeah. a good point to close. So again, I want to thank Ellen for a spectacular speech.